the Passover, they would remember that God rescued them out of Egypt. Um, the festival of tabernacles or booths, they would remember that God provided for them while they lived in tents in the wilderness for 40 years. Holiday times are times of remembrance and they are times of retelling the story that you are remembering. And God tells his people, have a holiday, stop work, rest, and remember what I have done for you. And that is a pattern in, uh, in Old Testament life, and it's a pattern in New Testament life. And we've carried that tradition on, haven't we? Uh, we remember Christmas at our Christmas holidays, and we remember Easter in our Easter holidays. And lots of Psalms, what they do, they are, they are retelling the story. They're retelling the story often in a holiday. Um, Psalm 135 is a good example. Uh, where they, they say that he sends signs and wonders. He struck down many nations. They are remembering what God has done. The people telling that story of what God has done. And the first five verses of this psalm show us that that's, this is exactly what they're doing. They're in a feast. This is a song uh, of joy. Sing for joy to God our strength in verse 1. Shout aloud to the, to the God of Jacob. They are making music. And what are they doing? When are they doing this? Verse 3, on a holiday, the new moon holiday, um, on the day of the feast. Um, And verse 5, when God went out against Egypt to establish it as a statute for Joseph. Um, This is a holiday, a festival psalm. But there's a big difference with this one that makes it interesting and kind of unique. In other psalms of remembering the people, they tell the story of what happened. But in this psalm, they are interrupted and someone else tells the story. At the end of verse five, I heard an unknown voice say, someone else speaks up. Now it's not unknown in that we don't know who it is because in verse 10, the voice tells us, I am the Lord your God. This is God speaking. It is unknown in the sense that this voice is, is otherworldly. It is different. It is not uh, human um, like we would normally retell the story. Um, and this is God's testimony for the people of Israel. So I, I've, I just maybe have this image in mind, okay, of how we understand this psalm. Um, Imagine you are up here and you had the joy of giving your testimony if you are a Christian. And you would tell the story of how God saved you, of what he's done in your life and the circumstances. And then imagine somehow God spoke and he told your testimony, but from his point of view. Wouldn't that be kind of amazing? Wouldn't you love to know what he would say? Wouldn't you love to know the details which he includes and you don't, or the details that you didn't really know were there? Um, Wouldn't that be really amazing? Um, And I guess for some of us, maybe this is a silly, unhelpful example, maybe it's a husband sort of telling a story at a party who might be prone to exaggeration. And his wife steps in and says, no, it wasn't quite like that. Um, I wonder what the differences might be if God tells our testimonies of our salvation. And there's lots for us to learn uh, along the way. Um, And uh, uh, for us, I mean, this psalm reflects, well, there's there's a couple things going on. There's God is telling the story of him saving his people from Egypt, a specific group of people, the Israelites. But the wonderful thing for us is this psalm, it reflects God's heart and purpose in salvation. And I would argue that we do not live in a specific land and and place as God's people now, but 
God's heart and purpose in salvation has not changed. So as we read his account of his people's testimony, I think it's fair for us to imagine the heart, the meaning of what he is saying, kind of as Jesus saying that for us. Does that make sense? Um, so let's go through bit by bit, and this, I've split it up into four sections. The first is, really clearly, God says, I saved you. And in those verses 6 and 7, uh, he, he says that there, there's five things that he does. I remove the burden from their shoulders. Their hands were set free from the basket. I rescued you from slavery. In your distress you called, and I rescued you. I answered you out of a thundercloud, and I tested you at the waters of Meribah. There, that's when they are out in the wilderness. Those five things God is saying, I did all of them. You remember your rescue out of Egypt and your journey? Yeah, that was all me. I did that. And it's clear, isn't it? Salvation is all from God. And that is particularly clear in the Exodus. Um, do you know the story of, of Moses and the ten plagues? Um, if you, when you read those, they are absolutely mad, aren't they? They're, they're crazy, the sort of things that God does. And then the parting of the Red Sea as they escape from Egypt, they're over the top. And God is wanting to make it so, so obvious and so clear, just so we all know, it, we're agreed it was me, right? I did the plagues, I, I did the sea, I rescued you, I saved you. And for us, that's what God wants us to know about our testimony too. He did the saving, not us. It says in Jonah, salvation belongs to the Lord. In Ephesians 2, it says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is, a, it is the gift of God. We are only and entirely saved by Jesus. He came down into the world. He paid the price for sin that we could not do. He raised us to new life, which we could not do. He came and dwelt in us by his Holy Spirit and turned our hearts to believe in him, which we could not do by ourselves. So just to be really clear, if anyone is thinking here today that I have earned some favor with God, God would, and that earns my way to heaven somehow, God would say, no, that's not right. If anyone here is thinking, I need a bit less grace, than the person next to me, God would say no. Maybe you need more, because there's pride. Um, the first thing God wants to say in his test in, about the people's testimony is, I saved you. And that is a wonderful thing for, for them to learn and for us to learn. Um, secondly, um, verses 8 to 10 is listen and obey. God says in verse 8, hear me, my people. And I will warn you, if only, if you would only listen to me, Israel. God is pouring his heart out here that he wants the people to listen to him. And then he repeats something from Exodus 20, verses 9 and 10. Verse 10 is first in Exodus 20. Um, this is the bit before he gives them the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt. And then verse 9 is the first commandment. You shall have no foreign god among you. You shall not worship any other god than me. Um, and he is asking the people to obey. And this is God's heart for the people. Is he has saved them. And he has not just saved them from something. They were slaves in Egypt and it was miserable and I've saved you and now you can go and do whatever you like in the world. That is often how sort of Christianity is portrayed. That is not it. He's saying I've saved you from slavery in Egypt and I've saved you for 
a good, obedient relationship with me. God didn't just save from something bad, he saved them for something good. And that shows God's heart towards us. When he rescues us from slavery to sin, he calls us into perfect freedom in Christ. And freedom is obedience to him. And it is wonderful. Um, maybe think about it like this. that, uh, And we struggle with this, don't we? And I struggle with this. That if you had a moment of free time, it's up to you to do whatever you want with it, what do you do? That's not freedom, that's slavery, isn't it? We're slaves. And that's, that's the thing, isn't it? That often we say, I want more freedom, then I'll be more happy. My experience tells me, actually, no, that's never quite right. The more I do what my heart desires, often the more miserable I am. Would I be happy to spend 50% of my life scrolling through silly videos? No, it's a terrible way. That's not freedom. That's slavery. Maybe another way to think about it is, what is perfect freedom for a Formula One car? Well, it could be that if you had to go in a Formula One car, you could say, I'm going to take it down the motocross track, you know, where the, the motocross bikes go up the, with the big jumps and hills. You would not make it past the first little corner. Perfect freedom for a Formula One car is to drive around a Formula One track. That's what it's been made for and designed for. And human beings are the same. We have been literally made and designed to be in relationship with the God who made us, to receive his love and to love him in return and to love him through obedience to him. It's what we've been fine-tuned to do and to live. And when we don't, it grieves the Lord and is not right. It is sinful. But also, and here is the surprising point of this psalm. Look at the last bit of verse 10. He says, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. And the image that I have in mind is, imagine a, a little nest of birds. And their, their mum comes with some, uh, some delicious worms and all the birds have their mouths open wide. I'm ready to receive. I'm hungry. Fill me up. And God is there asking us to obey. And he's saying, I've got food. Why won't you open your mouths? Open them. This is food for you. This is good for you. And that leads us on to stubborn hearts. In that the people then and the people now have stubborn hearts. Verse 11, but my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. And this is the next part of God's story of uh, the people of Israel. And it's so true for us as well. And it's that line there in verse 12. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. And there's an example in this, uh, in this psalm um, uh, that comes later. Or was it before? When? Um, uh, no, it's later. How quickly would I subdue their enemies? The people of Israel were defeated in battle by foreign nations. And one true example for them is, and one way they disobeyed, is they followed other gods they said to themselves all the other nations around us they they follow gods like Baal or, or or other ones that we can read about in the old testament wouldn't our lives be better and easier if we followed the same gods that everyone else does wouldn't we fit in wouldn't it make our alliances easier our relationships easier with people around us and god probably heartbroken and his beloved people turning away from him 
says to them, okay, give it a go. Give it a try. And let's see how you get on. And God is so patient, isn't he? And so the Philistines come, they send a raiding party, and they pray to Baal, and nothing happens. Help does not come. And God patiently says, how long do you want to try this? Are you ready to come back yet? And maybe they are, maybe they aren't. And in the New Testament, Paul says something really similar in Romans 1. 24, he says, therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. The context here is about sexual immorality, but it includes other sinful desires. And they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They believed false things, false gods, false things about God. They grabbed the lie and drop the truth. And I, I, I just, I, I, mean, I say this maybe too often, but <clears throat> I wonder if we're in a moment in history where people are more ready than ever to say, what I've been trying is rubbish. Atheists are deconstructing their faith in nothingness and in meaninglessness, and they're hungry Those who have been told the lie that the more you just do what you want to do, focus on yourself and just follow your own own desires. Hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure. Those are wondering, why am I not satisfied? Why am I unhappy? Those who have been following lies about sexual liberty are experiencing more broken relationships and more loneliness and wondering why. There's a growing sense that something is missing. And that is God's patience in action. He is waiting and he is asking, are you ready to come back to me? And the amazing thing is, and that's so true in my testimony, that is so true. When Jesus told the story of the prodigal son, maybe the the most amazing bit is the father gave him the money and let him go. It's exactly that principle. And then waited for him to come back. And I know I've wandered and fallen into sin and been miserable. And it's taken me so long to come and say, sorry, sorry, will you have me back? And he does. Um, Fourthly and lastly, um, honey from the rock, verses 13 to 16. It begins in verse 13, if my people would only listen to me. This is God's heart towards his people. If only they would listen. And the thing, maybe the thing to have in mind is it's like God has got a, a huge bucket of blessing and he's saying if only you would come I'm ready to feed you and to satisfy you and look what's in the bucket how quickly I would subdue their enemies if you turn to me I can defeat your enemies I would have my glory back and I would punish those who hurt you verse 16 but you would be fed with the finest wheat with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. That is God's posture towards his people who have stubborn hearts. And that is so true for us, isn't it? When Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, he said that he had living water that satisfies. He was that water. Come and drink the water. That is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He is the honey that comes from the rock. He is sweet to the taste and he satisfies the soul in a way that nothing else will because 
everything apart from Jesus is, um, is, is tainted with lies and untruth. Only Jesus speaks truth into our life. Um, and his testimony for us um, is this. Come and, come and receive blessing from me. I am waiting. I can save you. I have the power. I have done all that is needed to bring you salvation. Come, repent and believe in me and you will be saved. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus, who is honey from the rock. And we just rejoice and marvel at your patience with the Israelites in the Old Testament, and we know that patience too. Father, thank you that, uh, like the, the prodigal son, that you have us back time after time. And Lord, we pray and we just help us to feed on you and your word and the person of Jesus. Amen.